Hello folks, nice to be here. Um, Yappy Chef, who here has heard of Yappy Chef? Who here has shopped from Yappy Chef? Okay, handful of you, great. All right. Um, let me tell you a little bit about us and then I will speak through a bit of the philosophy around how we've operated, um, share some thoughts about um, what we feel is important in the world of commerce um, and business in general. And, um, and then I'd be really open to taking questions and moving more into the discussion phase. Um, I've got quite a few slides, so I might jump around, but please, if you have any questions, raise your hand and let's get into discussion. It's usually more interesting than having someone stand up in front and uh, drone on in front of you. All right, so we are based in Cape Town, started here, started by my two partners, Andrew Smith and Shane Dryden in 2006. We turned eight next week, we actually have a birthday party tomorrow night. Thank you very much. Uh, they started in 2006, I joined them in 2008 uh, while living in London. My background was in design and branding and um, I got on board and we started chipping away at this, uh, at this little idea of theirs. Um, and we, in, in 2011, I got married and we were seven people in our business. To Chris, yes. <laughs> uh, we, were, we were seven people in the business. The whole Yappa Shift team was sitting at one table at my wedding. Um, and today, uh, three and a half years later, we are a team of 85. So the last kind of three and a half years have been pretty rapid. Um, and we started with one brand and 30 products. Right? That brand, Choosy Pro, it's still a brand that we sell to today. Um, we now sell over 200 brands from 8,500 products. A little bit of, a, of an overview. All right, what I want to touch on, and these are some of my kind of common themes. Um, changing marketplaces, why we see, how we see the world's changed pretty much since the advent of the internet. Uh, talk about the dark ages of customer service, some of the things around how we're delivering great service and what we think impacts people's experiences, um, and then wrap up with some closing points. As I say, please feel free to dive in whenever. All right, so this image is of your typical pre-20th century marketplace, all right? It was a market in the middle of a square filled with all your best friends and all your best enemies. Uh, no one had cars, no one could really go and buy stuff anywhere else. They had to go to the same market over and over again and they got to know all the people in the space. And the way that people succeeded or failed was based on a couple of things. Um, one being their relationships with the people on the square, right? and to the actual quality of the products that they were selling. Because when people were as intimate as these people no doubt were, it was very difficult to fleece people. Right? And if you did fleece them, then you got found out very quickly. So some interesting things that happened kind of towards the end of the 1800s, early 1900s, uh, one of the main ones being that the car started becoming democratized. So more and more people got access to car and cars and transport which meant that they could travel more freely and move away from these centralized marketplaces. Um, it also became quite a status of success if you could not live particularly close to other people like we all used to have to, right? And so people started to move into uh, suburbs, which also weren't particularly popular on this time. Um, and a bunch of other things started happening at the beginning of the 1900s, um, including the uh, proliferation of advertising, right? Your guys get. And, um, and this idea of uh, mass media. So radio came along, mass, mass print came along, TV came along during the kind of middle of the century, and all these methods that allowed people to communicate to markets of people en masse. Okay? It was very much a one-to-many form of communication. Um, prior to that, things were very different, right? And if someone offended someone or uh, someone served someone a bad product, people in that marketplace got to know about it very quickly, right? And word spread, and that business person needed to recover in some way, right? Um, this is essentially the kind of environments that we shop and have, have been shopping in for the last hundred years, right? Where no one really knows anybody, and you are attracted to buy what you're gonna buy based on the packaging and the branding 
of the products that you see in front of you, each of which is trying to shout out louder to you <coughs> to buy it than another one, right? Um, there's a, a phrase from the Future Train Manifesto, which is, again, it's kind of one of the documents that really informed a lot of our thinking around this. It was put together by a group of web geeks in 1999 when they saw the internet becoming what it was becoming. Um, and let me read this. It says, a powerful global conversation has begun. Through the internet, people are discovering and inventing new ways to share relevant knowledge with blinding speed. As a direct result, markets are getting smarter and getting smarter faster than most companies. All right. um, this idea for me is very much about people on the square or people almost getting back onto the square. Suddenly people are reconnected once again, right? And they're able to communicate faster than companies are. Um, and the, the opportunities that big business has had for the last 100 years of commissioning agencies or commissioning anybody to put out one-way communication to the world um, is fast becoming a thing of the past because we all know that we are far more influenced now by our friends and our colleagues that we are so closely connected to than what we are directly by advertising. So, 1869 to 2004 is a bracket that I've put around what I consider to be the dark ages of customer service, right? 1869, shock horror, is the date that the first full service advertising agency was established, right? I always run the risk of offending people when I say that in this, in this audience. Um, but 18, 1847, a magazine called Le Monde was laying out its content. And in that content, um, what, how they used to generate money was by selling for their cover price. Right? So the magazine would sell for a pound um, or a French franc or whatever it was at the time, and people would buy the magazine. And if the content was good, they would sell more magazines, and that's how the business made money. And one day in 1847, someone had a gap in their layout. And they said, well, we've got a gap. Let's Let's ask the local butcher if he'd like to advertise in here. And the local butcher <coughs> thought it was a good idea, and the butcher said to his wife, please will you write up an ad for me and tell people what they're selling, and we can put it into this little slot. And they paid Le Monde some money, and so this idea of print advertising um, in, a, in, a, in a modern sense was born. And in 1869, a group of people said, you know, we can tell these stories and sell products and get people excited about the products and sale far better than what the butcher's wife can. Let's create an agency that start, that's, that uses these wonderful, growing channels of communication right, to tell the world about these products. 2004 was the advent of Facebook. Okay? So these two dates which I pegged down, I see as being, on one hand, uh, the date that we started <coughs> organizations designed to master one-to-many communication, right? And 2004 being the date that Facebook, or Facebook's creation, which was mastered to communicate this idea of many-to-many -many communication, right? Um, so this is one of my great examples of, uh, from the dark ages. So I called copy tickets, looking for tickets to the Luries a while back, and the salesperson, it was five to five, and the salesperson said, hi there, um, I said I'd like to buy two tickets, and they said no problem, but it is five to five. It might be better if you phone back tomorrow, um, and we can get the transaction completed then because we do close at five. And I said, well, it's a bit strange. It's five to five. I'm sure we can get it done in five minutes. And the person said, okay, well, we, we, we can try. Okay, it's a bit strange. So we <laughs> proceed through the through the transaction, and at five o'clock she said to me, I'm really sorry, sir. We close now. Please call back tomorrow. She hung up before we finish the transaction. Right. So I was relatively flabbergasted. I don't really, I don't use Twitter as a massive uh, soapbox, but that evening I went on and I tweeted this, and it was shared by a few people. And uh, the following day, I got this response saying, "Hi there, please can you put me in touch with Mr. Paul Gladys. This is in response to his tweet regarding copy ticket. Kindly send me his contact details so that we, on behalf of copy ticket, can resolve his bad service experience. Kind regards, Celine, Project Manager in Media." And I got this, and I was like. I don't understand why I'm having a terrible experience with copy tickets and somebody else is responding to me. Right? <coughs> now this is also, you can see the date there, 2010, and no doubt you guys have been involved in many discussions over the years around this idea of online reputation management. Right? Like businesses that panic about, you know, they're moving into the online world and the future of retail and it's like, gee, we better hire someone else to look after this place called the internet because 
we actually don't know what it's all about. And, and I think it's a good example of people living very much in the past, right? This, the idea that, that you don't need to take responsibility as a business for the reactions of your customers um, in, on the internet is something that I think businesses are quickly getting to grips with. They actually have to play an active part in that space. My, my vision of this is of some blundering fool who's probably drunk and in a torn tuxedo, blasting his way through the marketplace, tipping over trays and knocking over people's apple carts, and some meek and mild person coming up behind with a dustpan and brush is like, oh, I'm really sorry, he's, he's not as bad as he looks, while, yeah. while the fool continues blundering on into the future. Right? Um, it's, it's really, uh, we don't believe to be a, a kind of a, a tenable um, way to operate. And I think it's a way that businesses in the past with big budgets who could just constantly shout at the audience and say, we are the ones to go for, we are the people who, are, who have these great offers for you, etc., etc. Everyone's sitting in the isolated blocks, unable to communicate their experiences with one another, just continue buying the promotional line. Um, here's another example. There's a crowd called Easy Life Group who were a catalog industry. People used to, they used to drop off thousands of catalogs into people's <coughs> post boxes in the UK. People would pay to do the catalogs, choose the items that they wanted, and um, they would then uh, fill in a form at the back of the catalog, put it into an envelope, put in a check, post it off, wait for two weeks, and hopefully two weeks later they get their product back. And um, if the company never had, didn't have the product because they were oversubscribed, they could simply send the check back, um, write back and apologize that they didn't have the product. Um, but a couple of important things happen in this context. Ignore the website for a second, but if you think about it as a, as a, as a book. One is that the company never took people's money. Right? When you send someone a check, that money is only taken when the person chooses to deposit that check, the business chooses to deposit that check. Um, and two, people were sitting in isolation making their decisions and their lounges reading the magazine. This company in 2008 decided to go online and very soon after going online, because the, the owner's assumption was that, you know, we pretty much run an e-commerce business, we are. We have thousands of, of items in, mag in, in print magazines, we, um, we sell to customers all over the country, uh, they order in a form, they pay, it's pretty much the same thing, let's just move it online. And they underestimated a couple of things. Um, most specifically, how immediately people demanded a response once once they'd actually made payment, right? Um, unlike sitting writing a check. And two, they underestimated the um, speed with which people could share their experiences when things went wrong. And the reason I know about this is because I was asked to have a copy with this MD um, a while back because they he didn't quite know what route to take and they had they received quite a battering from the community. So this is when I when I was asked to have a copy with them, I looked them up and I saw these results and then I saw this Easy Life group, customer reviews, one star, 22 reviews. Dark ages, arrogant incompetence. So it gets a little bit scary. And so I dived into it and I found this complaints about charge, ask for owner grade capital was the person I was seeing. Update of part of update part of order received with no data info remaining item. Full refund required, etc. It goes on and on and on. All these particularly unhappy faces. And then the number of views that people had seen, right? So this specific item had seen 618 times, 676 times. <coughs> and I thought I had found possibly a hot bit of anger, you know, maybe one one site. Um, I went to another one, went on and on, the way of this firm, get another satisfied customer. Um, this person had written a thesis about what was going on. Dire customer service, payment taken, but goods undelivered. And what, what struck me at the time, and this is not news for anyone in this room, right? But what is an important part of, I guess, where we're all going is this idea, right? This whole word of mouth thing that for decades we've all been saying it's the best form of marketing and it's blah, blah, blah. It, it's archivable, which it never really used to be, right? So we go and do good things and serve people well and people write about it online and other people read it and the stuff sits there. It sits there for ages. It's not just you speaking to your sister-in-law mm -hmm. about the one great experience you had and then she is the, one, is the only person who hears about it and goes to the media. So the responsibility that we have as businesses to, I believe, up our games and deliver exceptional service um, is, 
exaggerated, or not exaggerated, is uh, the, the mandate is even greater because of this reality. Um, this is my best example from the Dark Ages. Right? So, hi, my name is Judy Ram. I'm Rina. I have a wonderful story about Yappy Chef to share with you. Yesterday, I was meeting with Philip Austin, one of the owners of the Moya restaurants. Philip told me he was really impressed with your company. As it goes, he had recently ordered a pan and arrived with a broken hand. Philip wrote to complain, and Yappy Chef promptly sent him a replacement pan. This made such a positive impression that Philip was now telling everyone about the amazing customer service at Yappy Chef. Well done, sincerely, Judy Ram. And we get this mail, and we kind of feel good about ourselves because there's someone who's chucked out there and someone who's talking about us. And I look at this mail and I read it and then I reread it. And I have to ask myself, like, what the hell is going on here? Right? A guy ordered a pan. He paid top dollar for a top quality pan. It arrived with a broken handle. Right? He phoned us to tell us it arrived with a broken handle. We apologized and sent a brand new one the next day. And now he's telling everyone how amazing our customer service is. Right? All, all we did was what we were meant to do 48 hours later than we were meant to do it. Right? What else did he expect? <laughs> what, what, what story, what else could have happened? Then he phones and we say, oh, sorry, not, not our fault. Not, you, you must have broken it. And we all know that kind of feeling in our stomachs when something goes wrong and you have to take it back to the store and you're like, oh, geez, will they trust me? And like, it, it, it broke before I even took it out of the box. Right? And it, it's a massive opportunity for us, for all of us, because we are working off such an incredibly low base of customer expectations. Right? We do the most basic things, and people, we, we, get, we get so much positive feedback at Yuppie Chef, and I'll touch on some of the, of the ways that we're going about doing what we do, but so much positive feedback. And I promise you, we hardly do any more than what it says on the box. Right? Um, and I think that for a lot of people, that is just a refreshing experience to have. Um, very often, kind of people who refuse to take broken products back. Um, the, the, the image I have in my mind is of someone kind of coming into the store and saying, "Hey, sorry, this is broken. Can you help me out?" And the store owner sitting there with his hand on the cash register, saying, "Sorry, but we've got your cash. It's, it's ours now. It's not. But we're not, we're not going to give it back." The person like, "Yeah, well, I bought this and it's broken. It's not working." Like, yeah, sorry, you, you must have broken it. And it's kind of victory for the store because they kept, kept the cash. Um, one of the things that we realize is hugely important in this space is the importance of customer relationships. And it's something that I'll touch on a little, in a little bit of time again. Um, is that no longer do you have one customer walking past your one store and buying from you and then disappearing into the ether forever. <coughs> and you as a business having to make that sale. Right? You've got people who can engage with you at any time online, whether it be on their phone, on their laptop, on their iPad. Um, the, the, the value of building customer relationships far outweighs the value of making that sale there and then in the moment, which I think maybe may not have been people's perspectives in time gone by. All right, some points on how we're delivering great service. I'm going to touch on these things <coughs> gratitude, culture, remarkability, and care. So, when, when my two partners started Yappy Ship in 2006, um, this picture in the background here is a, is a visual of the, a glass wall in our customer service area, uh, which has the names of the first 200 customers who ever shopped with us uh, frosted on the, wall, on, on the window, right? It took us a year to get 200 customers, right? Um, my partner's names are Shane Dryden and Andrew Smith. The first person to shop from us was Bevan Dryden, right? Shane's dad. Um, <laughs> then it was Andrew's aunt, then Shane's aunt. And every day, they, every, every, not every day, whenever they got an order, which was every few weeks initially, to come to their phones and Andrew would be like, oh, it's, it's your aunt or oh, no, it's my family friend or whatever. And the seventh person to shop from us about four months in uh, was a woman called Denise Gunner. And Andrew got the, the order on his phone. He's like, oh, it's not from my family. It must be someone from your family. <laughs> so she, she was like, oh, it's not from my family. And he said, what, what, what do you mean, a real stranger? <laughs> and, uh, high fives, crack the champagne, celebration. <laughs> And one of the things that Shane said was that he couldn't just send out a product in a box to this person who had taken such, a, in our world, such a leap of faith to shop from us that he had to write her a note. And he wrote her a note saying, Dear Denise, thank you so much for shopping from us. We really appreciate it. Enjoy your cheese grater. It was a Cusipro cheese grater <laughs> for 99 Rand, which I think now sells for about 289 Rand. And um, he said, If you need anything else, please let us know. And cheers, Shane and the Upper Chef team, which was Shane and Andrew sitting in their lounge in Plumstead. 
hoping that the next order would come through. And a few weeks later, the next person ordered, so Shane had more than enough time to handwrite the next card. <laughs> and it turned into one of these things that just became a part of what we did. Right? And so this idea of gratitude, we celebrated in fact our first year customer in 2006 with a handwritten card and have done the same with every customer ever since. Um, it's become very much baked into our DNA. Um, we, everyone who starts working with us spends the first hour of their first day writing cards, right? Whether you're joining us as FD or as a box packer, um, it makes no difference. Uh, you get told why we write cards, you get given some, some examples, um, and there is no script, right? You get shown some stuff that people have written in the past, but the idea is let people write what they want to write. Um, some people draw dinosaurs, some people do crazy things, sometimes it's just, hi Mike, thanks for shopping from us, cheers, for the Upshift team. And once you spend your first hour writing cards, you get a badge, like that, saying I write cards for the Upshift. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a really fascinating element for us. I know there are a few other businesses now that are handwriting cards with their orders, um, and I think it's a nice touch. There, there's, someone wrote an interesting article on Mark Lives uh, a few weeks ago, about, and they mentioned us, um, interestingly, in an article alongside the ANC and the DA and talking about politics and comparing politics to how we serve customers. But one of the interesting things about the reaction we've had from these things is, oh sorry, what, what was analyzed in the article was that we do these things after the purchase. Right? We don't do these things before the purchase. So it's not like, oh, here's an attractive little thing, let's try and entice you to make the purchase. People have paid, the money's in the bank, it's, done, it's a done deal. And we'll then write a card thanking them for the purchase. And I'll show you in a second, we'll go to effort around the packaging. Um, and there's something around, I suppose, the, the gratitude and the generosity of that that seems to have picked up, that seems to have created quite a lot of momentum for us among the community. Um, as you can imagine, writing cards <laughs> when there are at times uh, thousands of orders going out in a day is a pretty challenging thing. Uh, last year, December, we had nine full-time card writers. We'll probably have 15 or 16 this year, December. Um, everyone in our business can volunteer to write cards for a few minutes a day, which helps relieve pressure. Uh, we built technology to allow hundreds of cards that are written in this room to get into the right box that sits in the warehouse at the back. So um, it's, a, it's very much, as I say, very much baked into our culture, and every now and then we get our own handwritten card back. Mm -hmm. That was on our on our car windscreen a while back. Let me stop mm -hmm. at the, I think that is one of the the one thing that struck me when right. I bought one is the fact that you get a handwritten card. I mean, yeah. it, it's such a small thing, but yeah. it makes such a difference. Yeah. yeah, that's nice to hear. Don't, don't stop. It. I had I had a, a an older teacher of mine actually called me one day and said, Paul, do you know? I just ordered something from your business. Mm. And I must tell you, you know that it arrived with a handwritten card? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know, it's amazing. <laughs> it was like as if one of our star, one of our rogue staff members wrote this card and sent it off. <laughs> uh, all right, this is another uh, topic that I'm quite uh, passionate about. And and again, I think it has a lot of relevance to, to, to you guys as an agency. It's this idea of culture equals brand, right? And with my background in design and branding, I used to be very obsessed about the idea, that, and because I was a designer in my past life, I was obsessed by the idea that the way stuff looked and felt very much defined the brand, right? Um, and I know different people, the copywriters would argue that the way the copy reads defined the brand, and the um, creatives would have their own view. But as we've grown this business and we've tried to put our finger on what it is that makes yuppie ship yuppie ship what has become more and more apparent and looking at other businesses around the world i think th those that have a heart and really build strong community around them um, you can tie a lot of that back to this idea that the brand of the, of the company really is the culture of the company and i think it's it's a really challenging thing as an agency and I imagine this, I, I haven't worked um, in agency, but the idea of creating brands for businesses, which you know will resonate with an audience, right? but may not be authentically tied to the people on the inside of the business. Right? And, and what we've found over time is that you, you can do things in a million different ways. 
provided they come from a solid core of knowing who you are, it generally turns out the right way. It's like knowing a person and having they have a character. You pretty much know that everything they're going to do is in some way, shape or form going to be on character. Um, so this idea that our culture is the most authentic and stable brand experience that we can create. Um, this was an online chat with a guy called Mike. Someone who said, hi, do you live in Namibia? If so, what are the terms and conditions? <laughs> Mike just <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the reason I put it up here is that for, for us, a lot of it is to do with the type of people that we, that we put on board, right? Um, we're out there looking for good people who we think share a lot of our own values, right? Um, people who don't take themselves too seriously. People who um, are more interested in doing exceptional work and uh, contributing in some positive way to the world. We think we, 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 we're playing a role in changing the world by doing business exceptionally, right? Um, rather than people who are joining us because they want to be the world's next millionaire, right? Um, and then once we have them in the business, letting them free to be whoever they are, right? And let people on the outside see people on the inside. Um, this was another thing. We have a test kitchen at work where we, about a year ago, we started selling specialty food ingredients, and these were beer bread tastings. And this idea of showing people, um, and not doing it to show people, but having our staff engage in what we actually do, right? Which is around food and kitchen and cooking, and then sharing that publicly. Um, this is a, in our test kitchen, we have a once a month breakfast where we all eat together, um, and the kind of general company updates. But this, big, this focus around food and eating together um, and sharing is a big thing for us. Um, I, I, have a co I have two cousins, actually. One is a 32-year-old uh, investment banker, and the other one is now probably 13, but was uh, eight at the time of this, the relevance of the story. And my 32-year-old cousin used to say to me, you know, you have to open physical stores. And I said, well, why? And he said, well, people have to know that they're real people that they can engage in. People are kind of freaked out by the whole internet thing. And you know, they, you're know, you not going to build trust. People aren't going to give you their credit card details and blah, blah, blah. And I said, look, I, I hear that, but I don't think we have to open physical stores in order to connect with people humanly. And um, that was the one conversation. And a week later, my other cousin, the, the nine-year-old, came to Cape Town with my, uh, my uncle and aunt. They were having dinner at my house. And the nine-year-old's eyes started to glaze over as we started talking about business, as all of our eyes did when we were nine, and business became a topic of conversation. And at one point, uh, he, his, eyes per his ears perked up when he heard that I worked for an internet company. And he turned to his dad and he said, Dad, can we go to Portie's work tomorrow so we can see what the other side of the internet looks like? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yes, that is exactly what you can do. And it was this great phrase which we've kind of adopted internally, which is kind of, how can we show people the other side of the internet? We, we, we love the other side of the internet. It's a great work environment, it's a great workplace. There's, there's food everywhere, there are kitchen tools everywhere, there are people packing boxes, there are people writing cards. Like, this is the real business. It's not just this kind of e commerce facade with some warehouse in Paro and some, like, we're all under one roof. Um, and how can we share that with the world? So, his, my, my little cousin's phrase, um, was the answer to my big cousin's problem. It was we, we can do things, and, and again, the connectedness, um, the web allows us to share stuff with people um, for them to get, get to know us better by having them inside into our world. Sorry that was from Sochi, but I showed Ian Young around uh, during the course of last year, and afterwards he wrote me an email to say thanks for the tour and for the chat, and he wrote this, and I get the feeling that no one in your building works for Yuppie Chef. They are Yuppie Chef. Um, and I think this is this for me is the kind of sum of that idea around culture equals brands. Like the people in the business must be the business. All right. The next point is on remarkability, um, and this idea of prioritizing doing great things over telling people that we're doing great things. Right. Um, you know, you've got a bunch of money to spend, and you choose whether you're going to run it on an advertising campaign or whether you're going to run it on doing something better in your business. And we, we've, we've swayed back and forth on our confidence in traditional advertising means. Um, and, but I, th this idea came out from a discussion we were having a few, uh, probably two years back, where we were debating whether we should spend 35 grand on a four-page magazine ad and taste, right? 
and we were kind of, should we, shouldn't we? We had run a few before, we'd run a few in other magazines. And all of a sudden we said, hang on, what if we were to give our customer service team 35 grand a month, right? Call it a customer delight budget and just tell them, use this money, right? To delight and blow customers away and not even to bat an eyelid when there's something that needs resolving or even treating a customer, right? And we, the, the basic math we did was, if you had 35,000 Rand, if you can spend an average of 350 Rand on 100 customers in a month, right? we all know we're going to run an ad in Taste Magazine. If we go and do a survey, we're not going to find 350 people who even remember seeing our ad in Taste Magazine, let alone having read through it, engaged with it, gone onto the website and purchased something. Right? So in a lot of ways, we spent, we, we often challenge ourselves to thinking about how we can spend money and energy actually being more remarkable and then letting other people talk about us because of all the amazing channels we have available to us um, rather than uh, us spending time telling the world. This idea of remarking, which a year or so ago was, it was pointed out to me, if something is remarkable, it means that people remark on it. So that's, I that's like that idea. This point here is Kuruma, where we've, so we, we, we deliver for free anywhere in the country. Um, I put this point in here because our famous story that we've delivered a 60 rand spatula to Kuruman before, which cost us 300 rand to get it there. <laughs> <laughs> and we sit and pray every day that someone will order something more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is how our packages arrive, the cards change every few months, and the packing paper. Um, but there's the cards, there's the, there's the badges. Um, and to make that whole unboxing experience quite special. Um, Shane also told a story when we were starting out that he ordered a uh, computer case, I think, from um, G one of the stores that was operating online at the time. And it arrived looking like it had been run over by a truck. Right? Um, opened it up, no idea where it was from. Um, it had been a recycled box that had been used, or, or, or rather than recycled, a reused box of some other brand. Um, and at that point, we decided you know, people will never receive a box from us that looks scrappy or doesn't present itself in an exciting way with people opening. And then if you buy a knife from us, we send these out. This is a photo of the original design, but this is a, a one round coin now which goes out. Um, and so it says here, some crazy old looking old folk once told us that sharp gifts can slice friendships to smithereens. Unless a lucky coin is given them a gift. We like lasting friendships, so we figured we'd throw this in just in case the old folk aren't as crazy as they looked. <laughs> All right, and then care. We go to great lengths to hire people who care. We celebrate positive customer feedback above all else and share it daily with our team. Um, this goes back to recruiting people. This is not a start breakfast. This is actually a group interview. Right? Um, we, we've done a number of group interviews before, um, which are really interesting experiences. Um, we'll often have 60 or 70 people applying for a job. Um, we'll whittle that down to maybe 10 or 15 and it's, it's potentially for multiple jobs as well and we'll invite everyone in at the same time and we'll simply do activities group activities it's it's not an it's not a particularly good um, exercise to select people in but it's quite a good exercise to filter people out right and that doesn't mean that people are bad people when they get filtered out it just means that from observation in terms of the way they work in teams does this person let someone else contribute does this let, is this person to have a bearing in this context, um, who out of this group do we now want to go to the next step and spend 45 minutes or an hour or two hours in a one-on-one -on -one interview with, um, rather than being stuck with 15 or 20 hours of interviews, um, we've often used group interviews as a way to identify the type of people that we think would do well in our context. Um, and hiring people to ca who care is, uh, I think, one of the things we focused on most strongly over the last couple of years um, and people who get excited by the same things that we get excited by. Um, here are two quotes that I like. One, taking responsibility for a mistake and making an effort to resolve it doesn't mean you're wrong and the other person is right. It just means that you value your relationship more than you do your ego. And we value the customer relationship as much as we do the sale. All right. Um, and then community, the final one. Who here knows about the Willie's Lovebirds story? Yeah. Why? Put your hand up if you know about it. I'll decide how briefly I'm going <laughs> to tell the story. All right, I'll tell it relatively briefly. 
Um, so this idea of community, and I, th I think everyone is guessing about you know social media and commerce. And, you know, should we be selling through Facebook, and should we be? Uh, our, our view right now and has been for a while is that we use this channel to inspire, connect, entertain, and engage fans, people who want to hang out with us. We don't see it as a channel to push hard product through. Um, we we want to use it as a, a tool that our fans, our customers, are happy to allow us to, to, sorry, a tool that we use, which our customers are happy to allow us into their social space, right? Um, so let me go back and tell the story briefly. Woolies ran their first social media campaign in 2010, uh, titled Woolies Love Birds, and they, um, ran posters and flyers through all their stores around the country and this was the the banner which said Re to register go on go online to Willie's Love Birds on CLZA, tweet your Valentine and you can win fifty thousand Rand there we go in Willie's arches. And uh, Shane checked it out on the evening that it went live and he could went to the address and didn't go anywhere. He went to the address again and didn't go anywhere and then he realized that they misspelled the URL in the or the advertising, they left an S off the, off the web address. Right. So he went to see if Woolies Love Birds, which is what they meant to direct people to, was available for registration, which it was. So we registered it for $9 um, and <laughs> redirected the traffic to Yuppie Chef and uh, put this ransom note up um, on the landing page. We said, hello Woolies, if you want your Love Birds back, you must match every rand donated to Soul for Life by Yuppie Chef fans between now and 14th of February. What the love birds get. This you can create in like 30 seconds on ransom, ransom note generated at all. <laughs> um, and what was really interesting about this, and this I think was our first real, we've been doing quite a lot in the social space um, before then. And one of the reasons we were, I suppose, particularly inquisitive about Willie's campaigns, campaign was that at the, in 2010, a lot of the big corporates had done very little in the social media space. They were really nervous to play in, in, in the space. And so to see them having tripped up like this at their first attempt was, um, was something that we were obviously quite excited to try and capitalize on. Um, but we wanted to do it in a good way. Um, we, so when Shane had registered it, he called us and said, listen, this is what, we've, what I've done. Tomorrow morning, let's meet up and let's chat about what we do with this URL, right? Because all we had done was on the Sunday night, he had just bought the URL and redirected the traffic. We hadn't done anything else. And so we met together on the Monday morning and we said, um, a few weeks earlier, we had taken on Soil for Life, which is a great charity based out of Takai that teaches people how to grow their own vegetables in underprivileged areas. And we said, well, let's just, let's ransom the website back to Woolworths for 5,000 Rand. Right? We bought it for, we bought the URL for whatever it was, 90 Rand, 100 Rand. Let's ransom it back at 5,000 and we'll give it cash to to the charity and we thought great that's fine it was the same reason that FIFA was suing everyone during the World Cup right because they were catching on to everyone was trying to ride FIFA's coattails was the same reason why we could have been sued by Yuppie Chef someone uh, by Willie's uh, you can't launch a social media campaign titled Willie's Love Bird and then someone else registers Willie's Love Birds and tries to <coughs> so we thought that by doing something for charity we'd at least avoid litigation um, so and get some good PR on it. So we went back into our office, we were probably a team of five at the time, and said to Mike, the guy who was, who chatted the Namibian person, and said to Mike, um, and the other uh, two or three people, we said, this is, what, this is what we've done, and this is what we're gonna do, we're gonna uh, ransom it back to Woody's. And they were firstly pretty horrified that we would do something so evil. Um, and then Mike said, well, hang on, rather than just telling Woody's to pay us five grand and we give Soul for Life the money, why don't we engage our community invite them to donate to Soul for Life and challenge Woolies to match whatever they donate to Soul for Life. Right? And that way it ends up being us and our community versus Woolies, not Yuppie Chef versus Woolies. And it was just the greatest thought and comment and it changed our perspective on, um, on us and our community quite significantly. The, the donation portions were 25 Rand per donation and we had no idea whether kind of 50 people would donate or 1,000 people would donate. Um, we got a call from Woolies about uh, 12 hours after this went up, saying we, we're very embarrassed, you put us our pants down. Um, and, um, but we're very amused by kind of the way you've done it, and we think you've done it in good, in good humor. 
um, and we will pay your 5,000 Rand ransom. Because what we had done is we would said, fans must donate 25 Rand and Woolies must match it, but to a limit of five grand, right? And again, we did that because we didn't want to say to a limit of 50 grand and then we raised like 3,000 Rand. And looked at more <laughs> I mean, we had no idea what the response would be. So they said they would match five grand and they'd add two and a half. So they'd, they'd give us seven and a half. We said, oh, that's great. And by the end of day one, we'd raised about 12,000 Rand from our community. By day two, we raised close to 20. Day three, I got a call from Jeremy Mansfield, who used to head up 94.7 in Joburg, saying, look, I want to interview you tomorrow morning about this story, because I think it's great, and we can get lots more exposure for you and raise more money. And then I phoned Willie's back and said, listen, we're sitting on like 25 grand here. We're about to go on Joburg radio, um, and you guys have donated seven and a half. What I want to propose is that when I go on radio tomorrow morning, I raise the ransom to 100 grand, and you guys come along and match it. At which point, when the lady I was speaking to, Woody's went very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> she said to me, uh, "She said to me, it sounds like you're threatening me, and I don't like being threatened." So I, I couldn't. Co- I didn't have any comeback other than this. This is a ransom situation. Which <laughs> 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 didn't go down well. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it as a lie. But uh, no, I said to her, look, I'm not threatening you. I'm inviting you along for a ride. I think there's a big story to be had out of this. Um, us raising 50 or 100 grand for charity and you guys coming in with seven and a half, that's not really a story that is something that I don't think Willie is going to be proud of. Um, you let me know what the story is. I'm on radio in a few hours' time. Give me a call. And so a few hours later, I got a, um, a very serious call from a gentleman who I'm sure you all know. Uh, called Rob Stokes, um, and I'd never met Rob before, and uh, we're now we're now friends. And he called and said, "Paul, my name is Rob Stokes, and I manage Woolworths Online Reputation, and um, we need to ask you to back down." And I said, "Well, that's interesting." And we had this long discussion around why and the fact that people were rushing around looking for budget, and there was no budget, and blah 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 blah, and um, what was best for Woolies shareholders. And uh, anyway, at the end of it, he said, "Look, we, we've done what you asked us to do." If you wouldn't mind, please back down. So we went on it the next day. We gave Woolies credit for matching their seven and a half, but we kind of left them out of the story um, thereafter. And we went on by Valentine's Day to raise 116,000 Rand for Soul for Life. So it was a really fun campaign, got a whole lot of people engaged, um, and, um, and taught us about this idea of kind of being part of our community and not um, standing alone. So um, there we go. Now more of you know the story. And ironically, you know, we won, so we won a, a gold lurie for this, for best uh, viral campaign of the year. Um, ironically, only 12 people in the room knew the story. Um, but that's it. And then here we go, it's my last little example. We were doing an ad for uh, KitchenAid mixes, and um, we were one of the few places at the time that you could buy all the colors of the KitchenAid range. And so we were looking, we were doing all of our design in, in-house, and we're looking for, a, for a, a, a line for the ad. We went onto Facebook and said, hi, we need an ad, up for coming KitchenAid advert. Which color? Um, we wanted something along the Dulux ad idea. Uh, some examples we've thrown around the office are, which color fits your crouton, which color fits your cream, which color fits your pancake? Give us your best suggestions, people will make you famous. <laughs> and so we had a bunch of responses um, quite soon after posting it. Uh, this was our ad. Uh, which went up in House and Leisure Mag, the world's most colored kitchen appliances. And the line you can't read from there, the winning line was, which color needs your dough? <laughs> <laughs> um, and we put a little asterisk next to that, awesome. and under the logo put an asterisk and said there, we asked our fans on Facebook to suggest lines for this ad. Hit up for to Brendan Foster, who was the wizard behind this one, he is not famous. <laughs> and about three weeks after this went to print, Marina, who I worked in this with, came running into the office, she said, Paul, you'll never get your phone, you'll never get your phone. And I said, who? And she said, Brendan Foster. I said, who the hell is Brendan Foster? <laughs> she said, he's the guy who we made famous in the House of Leisure. And I was like, ah, oh, okay, awesome, great. And we, she, she did a, a blog post about it. And then Brendan Foster came along and wrote this as comments. So a lot of what we've tried to do is, is really quite playful with our community. You know, Marina, um, who really pioneered our uh, approach to social media, um, who's now very sadly left us, she's now working in London, um, 
but she would often say, you know, if you put something out to the community that is generous, right, and with no ulterior motive or intent, she says, people will flock to it like moths to a flame. So if you put something out there and there's some ulterior motive and you, you want to, whatever, collect email addresses, you want to make this thing, force this thing to go viral, she says, people will just stay away from it. Um, the community has this, this sixth sense. And this is a line which we liked, which we like. Which says everyone communicates, but not everyone connects. Um, and I think that's what we've, I suppose, interrogated a lot of when we've done. You know, a lot of companies just put out material over and over again because it's just part of the cycle. Um, we we try as best we can to make sure that what we're putting out there actually connects with people. And if it's not going to connect, we'd rather not put it out there. Okay, closing thoughts before I hope we have a little bit of discussion. Great customer service. And experiences require people to genuinely care, right? If people genuinely care, we'll be sure to deliver great products and services, in which case the busy, bustling, and reconnected marketplace will reward us by talking about us at speed. And that's it. Uh, <laughs>